to K4 won't let us connect actual video to the platform, but I can at least um, insert a link on K4. So if anyone wants to come to these and can't because they're gone on Saturday or you want to go over it again, welcome to uh, be able to go back and rewatch them if you'd like to. Um, and this week while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about, um, I came up with this title because I thought relaxation and meditation would get more people here than something like fear and anxiety or fear and frustration or something like that. But really when we're talking about these subjects, we do, you know, the thing that provides us to be able to talk to them is that contrast, the experience of, you know, when you had it really bad then you know how good you really have it and vice versa. And so that contrast provides it. And so we will be talking about relaxation meditation specifically, but we're going to be talking also about the opposite end of the spectrum to provide some of the contrast. Um, and really, I wanted to go a little bit of a different direction than we typically take conversations about relaxation exercises and meditation um, to more of, a, of the mindset uh, side of it. And and look at how each of us individually um, deals with our stressors and, and, uh, and things like that. So when we look at motivating factors um, and what motivates us to do the things that we do, and this is not specific to anything, this is everything that we do, the way we eat, the way we move our bodies for exercise, Right? The way that we interact with other people, our families versus our friends versus our coworkers, all these things, we are motivated by different things. And typically, we're motivated by one of three avenues. Really two, but these two are kind of the same. Um, and I want to start here to give us a good framework and foundation of what we're going to talk about afterwards. But when we talk about being motivated from a place of fear, it doesn't mean that we're scared. It doesn't mean that we are frightened. Fear is more associated with something external of ourself, doing it for um, somebody else's reason. And when we have fear-based motivation, we hear things like, I must or I have to. Somebody else has set the standards and the rules of whatever we're doing, and we feel like we have to do that. Right? We have diet programs. Well, I have to... I, I can't eat this specific food because that's not in alignment with this diet program. Or if I'm doing an exercise, there's a really popular exercise program right now called 75 Hard. And part of that is nutrition based, part of it is two exercise workouts a day um, for 75 days straight. And if you miss a day, guess what? You get to start over from day one. It's very fear based, right? I have to get to the gym and get my second workout of the day or I have to start over. So that's kind of fear-based motivation in our lives. Um, it's typically outcome-focused. It's driven by something external of ourselves. It's a work project. It's, it's outcome. It's an end result, not, not more about the process. Obligation motivation, I said that there's really two. I think the obligation and fear are very much the same. Obligation is a little bit more watered down than fear-based motivation. But these types of things we uh, associate also with outcomes, expectations. But we typically hear things like this with I should and shouldn't, right? It's not quite as hard line as I must or have to, I can't, can, those types of things. With fear-based, with obligation motivation, it's kind of we're on the fence about it, right? Everyone's been to the restaurant before when the waiter walks over at the end of the meal and says, who's ready for dessert? And we always say, oh, we really shouldn't. We shouldn't, right? Who, well, who said we shouldn't? That's, the, that's our decision, right? So obligation and fear-based statements are really what the main motivators are for most of the areas of most of our lives, for the majority of our lives. We're doing things other people's way, other people's processes, for other people's expectations and outcomes, and um, very rarely do we look inside ourselves to say, what's my part in this, this motivation process? And the last place um, of motivation, the third motivator is motivated from a place of love. And just like fear motivation is not frightened motivation or being scared, 
Love motivation is not this Valentine's Day version of love that we're talking about with hearts and lovey-dovey feelings. It's more about being authentically driven by who we are, the core of, of who we are as human beings. And um, this is internally driven. This is intuition-based. This is when we just feel, right, that something is off or something is on. We know we're making the right or wrong decision before it ever happens. That is being motivated from a place of love. And this is, this is when we um, hear things like, I want to, I get to, I'm grateful for, not all of these other, I have to do this, I should or shouldn't do this. It's, it's all choice. And this, this, before we get too far off the, the uh, subject, this is why when people ask me exercise, we had a conversation yesterday during the pool class. People were, some of the residents were asking, well, what, what's my exercise? What do I do for exercise? And my response was, I don't exercise. I don't believe in exercise because it's outcome focused. It's outcome driven. It's that I'm doing this activity because of this expected, this expected outcome. That it's going to make me healthier, faster, stronger, versus I'm doing it because it makes me happy in this moment right now, right? Um, so that's what we're talking about. And same thing with with diets. Like, think about all the diets that have been popular in this country over the last decade. Something like cabbage soup, right? The cabbage soup diet has been one of the top 10 diets for weight loss in this country for over three decades now. And no one in the world will ever be able to legitimately tell me and have me believe them that they're being motivated from a place of love. That all that they want out of that cabbage soup diet is they just love cabbage soup so much that that's all that they want going into their body for the rest of their life, right? That is not motivated from a place of love. It's motivated from a place of an outcome. And so we change our behaviors in our lives toward those expected outcomes. Um, and we might ask ourselves, well, what the heck does this have to do with relaxation, with meditation, with what we're here to learn about? Um, and so that's why we want to look at the opposite end, right? Of what, what the things are, not that motivate us, but what our stressors are in our life. So what are the things, without looking at any of that stuff or reading ahead, in your lives, what are the things that have caused us the most stress? Death and illness. Death and illness, okay. What else? Living yeah. up to somebody else's expectations. Living off some expectations, it pretty much, I, and really everything we do, like our work environments, going to school as children, learning these things, entering the, the workforce, all these things, um, are very much driven that way. But when we look at the things that stress us, right, um, when we can pull back, open the curtain, and really be introspective and look at our intention of why we're doing what we're doing the way that we're doing it, it allows us to see the correlation between the stressors in our lives, the things that are winding us up and keeping us up tight, and the motivating factors of what we're doing it for, right? If we're doing it from a place of fear, we're gonna have more stress associated with that. If we're doing it from a place of love, out of joy and peace and happiness in this moment, we are gonna have a lot less stress in our lives, identified stress. Um, the more externally outcome focused our objective, the more we stress we experience and, and opposite. So the thing we have to look at here is that this must be intentional and conscious. We have to be conscious that it's happening and it has to be intentional because the opposite is not true. If we're not focused on relaxing, our body naturally stresses out, right? We carry stress in our shoulders all the time, and a lot of times we don't even realize how stressed out and uptight we are until we're able to sit down and take a deep breath, right? And then all of a sudden, it's, it's, uh, it's like a wave that hits us. But it has to be intentional and conscious because the brain does not work in negatives. And what I mean by that is not that the, the brain doesn't have negativity, but the... Let me, let me, I'll use the way that Simon Sinek, if you're familiar with him, he's a, he's a, he's a, a motivational speaker or a leader in the field of 
leadership management. And, and he talks about the brain not working with negatives and saying, I'll give all of you an exercise. I don't want any of you to think of a pink elephant right now. Don't think of a pink elephant. But immediately what happens when I say don't is we automatically think of a pink elephant. Right? And so even if the idea and the objective is to, to not go down those rabbit holes that are sidetracking us and stressing us out, the status quo is that's what they're at because that's where our attention is. That's where our attention is pulling into our lives. If you, if you buy into the universal law of attraction that basically states that we create our own experience through our thoughts, behaviors, and actions, that everything that we do say and feel has some type of an outcome on, on who we are, right? Same thing applies, right? If, if I have a terminal illness and I am constantly thinking about that terminal illness, even if I'm focused on the treatment options that I have and traveling to visit my family and taking care of all of these things, in my mind, the still overarching focus is on that terminal illness. And so the brain doesn't work in negatives. And so if we're attracting thoughts into our experience, they are going to have an impact on our experience one way or another. And so um, this is one of my very favorite quotes, and it served as the foundation of a book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, but uh, he's also an author as well. But he stated, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you're at peace, you're living in the present. Across the board, these are all true statements. Because when we are feeling depression, a feeling of sadness based on our current circumstances, that feeling comes from an experience of the past. It is no longer currently happening to us. But the memory of that event or the person or place, whatever it is, causes us to make us feel those things. Right? So depression, sadness, emotions associated with the past. On the opposite end, we have anxiety or fear of the future, constantly worried about what am I gonna do in the future? What's gonna happen to my kids? What's gonna happen to my family? That's here in the middle. And then right here in the middle, that's the sweet spot, right? Finding peace, because that's really what we're all, that's the goal is to, to be able to find peace in the moment and let those peaceful in, in the moment, um, that awareness, ultimately create our life and our experience. Uh, mindfulness, the definition, I love it, is the moment-to-moment -moment awareness of our thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations, and surrounding environment with openness and curiosity. That's really hard to do, and I don't know anyone. I would, I would argue that even some of the like most mindfully trained monks that don't talk to humans and are up in the mountains would have a hard time with this consistent moment-to-moment -moment awareness of all that stuff. Thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations, and surrounding environments with openness and curiosity because this is the opposite of our status quo. In fact, we could even say the definition of stress, I think it's on the next slide here. The definition of stress could be the exact opposite of that. If mindfulness is being aware of all of that, stress is consistently being unaware of our thoughts, behaviors, actions, emotions, and bodily sensations, which ultimately close us off to new experiences and to progress to a more authentic version of ourselves. And that's the status quo. This is the whole work for um, uh, a man named uh, Joe, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who talks about we are recreating our same experience because our lives are the same. Right? We wake up in the morning, we do everything the exact same way. We get out of bed the same way, our morning process is the same way, we go to the bathroom, we might brush our teeth, we might turn the news on, look at our phone, email, whatever it is, everyone has a different morning routine, but it's very close the same. 
right? And so we don't ever break that cycle. That becomes the norm. And so if we live our whole lives in this constant state of stress, responding not to how we are feeling, not to what we want, but in but we're responding to others' expectations, others' outcomes, we're constantly stressed out because we're searching for an outcome that we don't even know if we care about, right? Happiness and joy is the outcome. And, you know, I, I believe that's everyone's lifetime why. We just want to live a fully authentic, joyful life. That's why we're here, to experience uh, um, emotion. And when we, when we kind of get away from that is when we get bogged down with all of the, the other stuff that's in the way. The programs and the societal pressures that tell us that we need to be a certain thing or a certain way um, with, with, uh, with diet and exercise, right? The way that we eat in this country is different. We look at the, the food that we eat, it's kind of a cultural phenomena that we tie so much of that part of who we are to our physical bodies and don't even acknowledge this kind of stuff, right? When was the last time you were on a weight loss journey and the coach or the trainer said, okay, what are we doing for mindfulness three times a day, right? It's all diet and exercise, diet and exercise. It's outcome driven and sometimes I don't even know if if that version of me is going to make me happier. I'm doing it because that's what I've been told my whole life society values. You need to look a certain way, to believe a certain thing, to feel a certain way, and if it's outside of that, I need to feel bad about it. Well, that's, that's BS. That's totally the opposite of why we are, why we are here to create this. Um, so we look at that and say, okay, well, stress serves a lot of people in a lot of ways. Right? Stress isn't always bad. Stress is a motivator. Right? We think about athletes. We, I learned about this in sports psychology. This arousal curve, it's called the inverted V. And this graph shows that as anxiety and pressure increases, so does performance, but only to a certain point. And then once that pressure increases past a certain point, all of a sudden, performance decreases. And um, and so we, uh, we have all of this stuff that's compounding into our lives and causing us distress and causing the sickness. We know that chronic stress leads to anxiety, it leads to depression, digestive issues, headaches, muscle tension and pain, heartache, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, sleep issues, dangerous weight gain or weight loss, and then all of those things that I just rattle off are all physical things that happen in our bodies. That doesn't even talk about the effects of stress on our relationships with other people, the way that we treat other people, the way that we respond to environment and things like this, um, career, general health and happiness. So we've got this chronic stressful state that's become our norm. And so to combat that, we have to do practices because it's conscious. It's not going to go away on its own. We will constantly live in a state of stress and fear unless we are intentionally and consciously focused on the opposite. Um, so we look at meditation, and meditation, the definition of meditation is a little bit different than mindfulness. Sometimes we use them synonymously and there's a lot of crossover, but meditation is just a practice in which an individual uses a technique such as mindfulness or focusing the mind on a particular object, thought, or activity to train attention and awareness and achieve mentally clear and emotionally calm, stable state. So it's ultimately how we each can regulate our nervous system response and identify when one of those negative emotions is creeping up on us. It's like, I don't know if any of you have experienced anxiety, but when people start to experience feelings of anxiety, it's very scary. They don't know what it is. They don't know what's causing it. They just have this unquantifiable and undiscernible feeling of dread in their lives that they cannot connect to anything, right? So we have this, this, this constant state of that. Um, so really, we could say that all mindfulness practice is meditation, but all meditation isn't 
um, necessarily mindfulness. Some meditations, I put a bunch of different types just to kind of say what we're talking about here. And then we're going to do one exercise to kind of close it off um, today. But transcendental meditation is what we typically think about meditation. When you hear the word meditation, your mind goes to seeing that person crossing their legs, holding their hands in certain mudra with their eyes closed and kind of doing chants. That's traditional, what we call transcendental meditation. It's a very small portion of what of the meditation is actually being practiced today. Um, yoga is a form of movement meditation. And the asanas or positions or stretches in those yoga practice, practices have been linked to specific energetic centers in the body and opening the body up to new experiences. Um, and so that yoga is a really great practice to kind of merge the mind-body um, connection in a little bit more comprehensive and healthy way than just saying exercise to burn calories. We start to incorporate our breath work and um, the thing I love about yoga is it's very intention-based. At the beginning of every yoga practice, um, we set an intention. An individual person sets their individual intention, what they want to get out. And ultimately, an intention is just what we keep our attention on. It's a focus on something that when the mind starts to wander, like it does, like it probably has for all of you 50 times while you've been sitting here, the mind starts to go, oh, did I feed the cat? Or what do I have after this? Or what's for dinner tonight? That's just the way our brains work, all right? And intention serves as something central to bring us back, to focus, to not be distracted by all of the external, to be able to quiet the mind and focus. So I love yoga and I use it on a regular basis myself. Um, breath work is one that is, um, showing a lot of really amazing benefit and research. And the exercise that we're gonna do um, today is only a five minute breath work exercise, but um, Dr. Weir, who came up with this specific breath work, um, he's a, a psychologist and he ultimately said that this is what he has found to be the most effective way of um, dealing with anxiety in his, his, his patients. He said he's had people that have very severe panic disorders. So panic attacks that come out of nowhere. He says this breathing technique is more effective than anything else to, to eliminate that. Um, and then some of these other ones are kind of, well not kind of out there, but cold immersion is one that is gaining a lot of popularity right now, and there's a lot of research being done, and I would probably not recommend it to anyone in this room. <laughs> but it's ultimately exposing your body to freezing or sub-freezing temperatures um, to create physiological and mental emotional responses within the body. Uh, and a guy named Wim Hof really brought this to the surface in kind of popular culture, um, they call him the Iceman, and he's known for hiking Everest in shorts, and that's it. Shorts and shoes. He wears, sh like, literal shorts and shirtless, hiking Mount Everest. Um, but uh, cold immersion has been showing a lot of benefits um, across, the, uh, across the physical physiology of the body, not just for the mental-emotional balance. Floating, we've talked a little bit about. It's something that is um, making an appearance in some of the kind of metaphysical new age treatments, but floating is a sensory deprivation experience where you are floating on a, a water solution, water salt solution that is high sodium causing you to float. You become very buoyant and you just float on top of the water almost like it's solid, but it's supporting you at the same time. Um, the water temperature, the air temperature are the same as your body temperature. And so you're floating in what feels like space. And, and so it's a really great way to kind of reset and rewire the brain toward a baseline of relaxation. And then sometimes we don't think about the religious connotations of some of these things, but something like prayer 
you know, conversations with something higher than ourselves, our higher power, whatever that person or that force or source or whatever we want to acknowledge that, prayer and communication with the divine, something bigger than us, is a way to, to give us stability in life and to, to help us tap into that intuition. Because um, I believe that we all are entitled to the same source, religion, God, information, each of us, if we are open to it and want to find something out, each of us is entitled to do that, energetically, through our emotions, listening to our body. Um, so that's just a few types of meditation. Before we um, talk about breath work, have any of you, I mean, I know some of you have because you've been to either my yoga classes or like the mind reset classes, the mindfulness class. Um, outside of those environments, who has practiced some form of meditation at some point in their life? And what were some of the experiences? What did you the gain from class. it? Okay. And it was senior yoga. Senior yoga? And, uh, we would, I think I told you about this before. We would go in and lie down on our mat for uh, 15 minutes in total silence, usually in class with entire fill group and fill group women. Mm -hmm. And the one the um, instructor was a lot, he was an East Indian lady, amazing woman yeah. in her 70s. And then from there on for an hour, there would be no conversation in the room. Yeah. And um, that's pretty amazing for a bunch of women. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what allowed me to get past all this stuff that was wrong in my head. Because after a while, you it's so marvelous, and you realize yeah. it's happening to you. Yeah. And once you found it, it's yours. Absolutely. And I it's, love that. it's incredible, and I think everybody in the class felt the same way. That's awesome. I do. I love that because that's that reminds me of of what he said last week when he came to the mindfulness class. The first five minutes, he was like, "How am I going to sit here and not say anything for this whole class?" And then a few minutes later, you just find this sense of kind of peace and calm and it feels good when the brain is not constantly trying to process all of the chaos outside ourselves. What else? Who else has had good experiences? Uh, I haven't thought about it in oh, how many years ago. I used to love to float. I mean, get in a swimming pool. As a kid, we'd go, you know, go, go swimming every summer. Just to lay there and float. It's just, it was just so relaxing. You know what people would go through that. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, but I hadn't thought about that probably in 70 years. Well, and the floating too is very even outside of the floating we just talked about in these special tanks. Floating has always been very therapeutic. In fact, one of the the um, hospitality based wellness programs I used to work for, we did an evening meditation in this kind of natural crater, um, beautiful warm water, and we would just get pool noodles. And each person had a pool noodle under their knees and a pool noodle under their arms and their shoulders, and they just floated there in this warm water, and we would usually play music in the back of it. Yeah, very, very relaxing and therapeutic to, to float and just illuminate. And if you're getting the benefit sunlight. of getting your sunlight too, even better. Something to think about here. Yeah. It would yeah. be. I like that. Instead of beating us up. Instead of beating you up in the pool, <laughs> say, here's your noodles, we're gonna float on them for a couple hours. Right. One more thing, and I always used to talk so much, but I was going into surgery, and um, I had done all the things, major surgery, and all of a sudden the nurse checked my blood pressure, and it was crazy. And I said, oh no, what do I do now? And she says, very simple. You sit here for about three minutes and take <laughs> some deep breaths. And I, my husband was with me, and we said, yeah, sure. I did that, and it worked, and it was like, why am I taking high blood pressure medicine? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually used to use an example similar to that when we would do something like this. But then I realized, why am I needlessly causing a stress response in someone just to prove a point that they're going to get it either way? But I would say, I would ask someone a question like, you know, tell me the thing that you're most annoyed with about your current living situation. And 
And typically, it's either someone annoyed with their HOA or their landscaper or subcontractor or something they were promised when they moved into Ovation that hasn't happened yet or something like that that causes a stress response. We start to feel that anger and that tension start to build up. And, and we would do the uh, pulse and a blood pressure in that heightened state and then step back and do a five minute breath work. And it's amazing to me how fast and how fast the body responds to natural remedies, to blood pressure and stress spikes, how much faster that it does that way than regular medication and says, yeah, let's do this so I can constantly live in a state of stress. Like that to me is not the answer. We live in a constant state. So any other meditation experiences that you'd like to share before we move into this breath work? It's a five minute thing. Now, um, this specific, it's called four, seven, eight breathing. We're gonna do a four second inhale. We're gonna do it along with a, a YouTube video. So you can do it with your eyes open watching it and it will actually count down the inhale, it will count down the hold, and then it will count down the exhale for you if you want to. Or you can just sit there and listen to it because you'll be able to hear the, the different inspiration and expirations. Um, but it's a four second inhale through the nose. And I put up there forcibly because we want to get as much oxygen in the body in that four seconds as possible because we're then going to hold it for seven seconds at the top. So we're going to breathe in for four seconds, hold all that oxygen in for seven seconds, and then our exhale is going to be eight seconds long. And it's going to be with our lips pursed, almost like we're blowing through a straw. Um, now, if, if you start to get very lightheaded, like sometimes it will happen within the first two or three cycles of this, you'll find yourself like you're floating away. And that's fine, just close your eyes, and I mean, that's the whole point. Um, but, uh, but I would not recommend standing up <laughs> until, um, until we get through the whole activity and you have all of your awareness and bearings back. So, so I'm gonna turn the lights off there a little bit too. We don't want commercials. through the mouth and pursed lips for a count of eight. I'll guide you with breath sounds as we go, so you can keep your eyes closed if you wish. Okay, let's begin.
Thanks for watching, take a deep breath. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe, like and share. just a little bit every day, you know, two or three minutes in the morning, two or three minutes in the, in the evening of dedicated breath work alone will pay a lot of dividends in, to in total um, uh, relaxation and just feeling in a, in a more um, state of, of or consistent state of bliss and joy rather than constantly running around trying to uh, live up to everybody's that's it for today. Thanks so much for coming. If you have ideas for future topics that you'd like covered or discussed, there's uh, some little sheets, uh, a little uh, uh, box on that back table. If you put a slip in the paper or in the box, that'd be awesome. Thanks. Appreciate it.